what rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise headed for that jubilee under in the sky now oh what singing oh what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise oh what glory when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky, it seems that now I almost see all the same dead rising o'er that jubilee that is just ahead. In the twinkling of an eye, change with them to be all the living saints to fly to that jubilee. Well, all what singing, all Morning when we all shall rise, oh, the day what of glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky, now when with all that heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring, millions there will join that song, with them we shall be raising Christ to ages long heaven's jubilee oh, oh what, the day what singing sing. oh the day what of shouting, shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise oh the day what of glory glory high hallelujah when we meet our blessed Savior in the now I said oh Morning when we all shall rise, oh, what glory, high hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good evening. It's good to see everyone tonight. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. I hope you've come to worship him tonight. We just want to welcome everyone tonight, and especially if we have any visitors tonight, we welcome you to Post Town, and we ask that you stop by the Welcome Center on your way out, and uh, we have something for you. But we're so thankful to be here tonight, looking forward to what God has in store for us. You know, I love the verse in the Psalms where it says, Power belongeth unto God. Amen. He has all power. He has all the power that we stand in need of. And so I'm so thankful that we can trust him tonight. Join with me as we open with some prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do praise you. We thank you that we serve a mighty God. And Lord, that there's nothing too hard for you. Lord, you have all the power. You have all the strength. You have everything that we stand in need of. And we know that, Lord, without you, we're nothing tonight. And so, Lord, we just look to you for help and strength. We pray your anointing upon the service. We pray that, Lord, you would use everyone, Lord, to just lift up Christ in everything that is said and done. May it be for one purpose, and that is to draw us closer to Jesus. Jesus. And we pray for the lost tonight. We pray especially, Lord, open their ears, open their eyes. Lord, we want to see every soul saved that we possibly can. And so, Lord, use us, we pray. We commit the service into your hands, and we trust you tonight. Have your way. Be glorified in everything. We give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's remain standing tonight. How many of you have been with Jesus today? Amen. Then you ought to be able to sing this as a testimony. All day long I've been with Jesus, and it has been a wonderful day. I have climbed up one step higher in that good old gospel way. I've been with Jesus all day long. Sing it one more time. Been all day long I've been with Jesus, and it has been a wonderful day. I have climbed up one 
one step higher in that good old gospel way. I have spoken words of kindness, and Lord, you know it, I have done wrong. I will go and make it right so I can testify tonight. I've been with Jesus all day. Travel through this pilgrim land There is a friend who walks with me Leads me safely through the sinking sand It is the Christ of Calvary This would be my prayer, dear Lord Each day to help me do the best I can Hold my hand. Jesus, hold my hand. hand. Let's sing this now. Jesus, Jesus, hold my hand.
blessed Jesus, hold my hand. When I kneel in prayer, I hope to meet you there. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Wonderful light, a beautiful place, a mansion fair, and skies ever bright, and skies ever bright, where all who believe the Savior near forever shall stay, forever shall stay, and having been saved by grace divine, I'm going that way. Still astray in sin, my Savior may know. My Savior may know. I want them to sing His praise above some beautiful day. Some beautiful day. Oh, glory to Him who died for me. I'm going that way. shall meet him at the gate when trials are past when trials are past i know i shall meet him face to face in glory at last and oh i believe that when we meet well done he will say oh trusting his soul I know I shall meet him face to face in glory at last. And oh, I believe that when we meet, well done, he will say, well done, he will say, for trusting his soul, redeeming love, I'm going that way. the Savior I adore. He's with me each day. With me each day. I'm clinging to Him. I'm clinging to Him. And never to stray. And never to stray. 
Just singing his praises all day long. I'm going that way. Are you going that way, Brother Jim? <laughs> you know, there's a guarantee in life. You're going some way. What way are you going? I'm going that way. Thank the Lord. Well, there is a lot on our prayer list. I'm just glad we serve a big enough God that can take care of all these. Ron Alfrey family... Um, needs our prayers. He passed away yesterday. Sharon Johnson is having more surgery Friday. Roy Byers needs lifted up in prayer. His blood sugar is really bad. He's got a lot of issues there. Brother Rob McCarty, let's remember him and his stomach, his digestive system. Jay and Jessica Sufkin, uh, Janice Leninger, Judy and Lori Carpenter, James Julby, which is Carla Wilson's grandson, needs lifted up. Holly Rose has cancer. Megan Ward still needs lifted up in prayer. Joanne Campbell, which is Janet, Newson, Janet Noonan's, well, I'll get it out here in a minute. Janet Newman's niece has cancer. Sorry, God already, he already knew it. Kaylee Tolson is a three-year-old that is having some kind of treatment done. Then uh, we don't have a name, but an 80-year-old woman needs our prayers. So let's remember that one. God knows her name. Phyllis Webb is having hip pain. And Carla Hiley is having a back seat procedure done. Then Linda Joseph has medical problems. So there's a lot of medical issues that are on our list. Yes. Dave Miner needs lifted up. They think he had a stroke, but they're thinking it's Bell's palsy, which is many strokes, isn't it? So let's remember him. Well, we got a lot to go to the Lord about. These altars should be full. Maybe pick one of these that's on the list and bring it before the Lord. As I've said before, there's something about getting on our knees in reverence. Because I guarantee you when you get to heaven, you're going to be on your knees. I don't think there'll be a person standing looking him face to face. I know I'm not worthy. But let's stand. Let's gather around the altars. Brother John, I'm going to ask you to come pray for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come, Lord, humbly before you tonight, Lord. Lord, what an honor, Lord. Lord, what a privilege, Lord, it is, Lord, to go to you in prayer. Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, for this service, Lord, that we are gathered here together, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you, Lord, would take the first place, Lord, in and through this service, Lord. Lord, let you be glorified, Lord, in and through this service. Lord, we pray, Lord, if there be one here tonight, Lord, that doesn't know you, Lord. Lord, that it is an in rightly relationship with you, Lord. Lord, they would come, Lord, Lord, to the feet of the cross, Lord, and that, Lord, you would deliver them, Lord, from a life of sin. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the singers tonight, Lord. You would anoint them, Lord. Anoint their lips, Lord, as they worship, Lord. Let them worship in the beauty of holiness, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Lord, for your messenger, Lord. We pray you would anoint him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, Lord. Lord, may you proclaim your word, Lord, with Holy Ghost boldness, Lord. Lord, we pray you would do the preaching tonight, Lord. Lord, may your Holy Spirit do its 
work, Lord. We pray, Lord, may your message, Lord, bring forth much fruit, Lord. Lord, let this not just be another service, Lord. But, Lord, we pray, Lord, you would rekindle, Lord, the fire, Lord, in each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Lord, let that revival, Lord, Lord, we had, Lord, a few weeks ago, Lord, continue to spread, Lord, and break out. Lord, we pray for more of a soul-winning burden, Lord. Lord, let Post Town First Church of God, Lord, be a soul-winning station, Lord, for you. Lord, we pray you would add to your church tonight, Lord. Get a hold of men and women, Lord. Raise up a generation, Lord. Lord, that would be full of the Holy Ghost, Lord, that would not stray, Lord, from the truth, Lord, but would proclaim, Lord, your gospel, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, let you be glorified, Lord. Lord, there's so much filth, Lord, and ungodliness in this world, Lord. But we thank you, Lord. Greater is he that's in us, Lord, than he that's in the world, Lord. And that, Lord, we are overcomers, Lord. Lord, for you've already overcome this world, Lord. And we pray, Lord, help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to stay on that narrow way, Lord. Not just go with, Lord, the flow of the world, Lord. The wide and the broad way, Lord, which everyone else is going. But, Lord, let us stay on that narrow way, Lord. Lord, it may be hard, Lord. There may be many obstacles, Lord. But, Lord, we know if we trust in you, Lord. Lord, you will lead us and guide us and direct us, Lord. Every step of the way, Lord. Lead us, Lord, in all truth, Lord, and holiness, Lord. Lord, we pray a rebuke against Satan, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We pray, Lord, your word, Lord, Lord, would find, Lord, good soil tonight, Lord. Lord, may your word, Lord, go forth with much power, Lord, and may you, Lord, just have the first place, Lord, in each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Let us seek first the kingdom of God, Lord, laying aside every weight, Lord. Lord, let us, Lord, come, Lord, boldly, Lord, to the throne of grace, Lord, and Lord, come and seek your face, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, have your way tonight, Lord. Let us see, Lord, an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight, Lord. Lord, we feel, Lord, your Holy Spirit, Lord, your presence, Lord, in this service tonight, Lord. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, may you, Lord, just have, Lord, the first place, Lord, in each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Lord, may you be glorified. May you be praised, Lord. And we'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise, Lord, for what you're going to do, Lord. And we pray, Lord, speak to those over even the live stream, Lord. Lord, we pray for those that aren't here, Lord, that you would speak to them, Lord, convict them, Lord, and restore them, Lord. And Lord, may your saving and sanctifying power, Lord, go forth tonight, Lord. Add to your church, Lord, we pray. Crown this service, Lord, with souls being saved, we pray. And we'll give it all over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. through faith, which is kind of an interesting thing, especially if they're Christians and Jesus is already living in their hearts, why would he then need to dwell in their hearts? And if you look at that word, and you look into the Greek, the word he's talking about, it's, it's not just simply to live there. If you can imagine that you own a house and somebody comes and rents a room from you and they have their own room and they've got their own kitchen area, they've got their own bathroom area, they live there, they very much live there. But you notice they don't have the right to tear down a wall. They don't have a right to repaint. They don't have a right to, to rip things out, to gut it out, to remodel it. But if then you were to give them the deed to that home, you would give them full ownership, full control. It'd be a little bit of a different story. And it's that idea that Paul's talking about to these Christians. And he says that Christ needs to be allowed to dwell in your heart through faith. So he has full control. And uh, he goes on. And he says, you who are already rooted and grounded in love need to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and width to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge. Because we're to be filled with the fullness of Christ, fullness of God, which Colossians tells us that in the person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. It's full control. And, and I, I certainly hope this morning 
that your relationship with Jesus is not just simply one that gives you fire insurance from hell, but there's a deeper walk. Because if there's not, I want you to know this morning that there can be, because his goal is to bring you into a deeper walk where he has full control over your life, and he's able to help you to become that person that he created you to be. tells us that there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And I just have this sense this morning that there are those of you this, this evening 
that you may be, maybe something happened in the past, maybe there's some bit of failure, and even though you've been redeemed, even though you've been forgiven, that the devil just keeps coming back, using it over and over and over, condemning you, bringing you that condemnation this morning. I want you to know this morning, as we sing this again, and I want you to sing this third verse with us. It is 224 if you want to sing it with us. But I want you to know this morning that it doesn't matter what your past is, that if you've been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, he says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them as white as snow. children so long have been burdened. We are longing for heaven's green shore, where heartaches are left far behind us. And the river and I'll rest neath the evergreen tree so I'll carry my cross through the midnight come morning there's glory for me Sometimes I'm despised and rejected, and I question, oh my Lord, how long? Then I take one more look at Mount Calvary, and it gives me the strength to go on. Come morning, I walk by the river, and I'll rest neath that evergreen tree. So I Through the midnight, come morning, there's glory for me. So I'll carry my cross through the midnight. Come morning, there's glory for me.
Good evening, church. In it may be morning, it may be noon, it may be night. In Matthew twenty four forty two, it says, "Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come." So we'll carry our burdens. We'll continue on carrying our burdens for our family for our friends, for each of us. Until that day, he calls us home. And like the hymn says, just be ready when he comes. In the second chapter of Ephesians, verses 19 and 20, the Bible reads, Now therefore, Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord. Lord of all. When darkness comes to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand, Christ alone, cornerstone, we in the Savior's love through the storm he is Lord Lord of all Well, glory to God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to service all day. It's good to have some of our children here tonight. And um, we're always happy when they're here. It's good to have Laurie and Patrick up here, our daughter and son-in-law singing. They pastor a church over yonder. <laughs> He's a preacher. I guess you could tell. <laughs> they were over, she brought our granddaughter over earlier in the week, and I took our little Chloe granddaughter, I took her fishing for the first time, and she actually caught a fish all by herself. And she was so excited. My daughter told us they were at Walmart later, and she was telling everybody at Walmart she caught a fish. <laughs> So if you heard some little girl talking about catching a fish at Walmart, that's our granddaughter. I'm dealing with our subject tonight. It's best to start with first things first. You know, the Bible declares, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, we being like sheep have all gone our way from the shepherd, turning our own way. But there must be a turning to the Lord. And the Bible calls that repentance. But Christ bore our iniquity. He bore our sins that we may repent. You see, the grace of God leads a man or a woman to repent. And to be saved. I don't believe a man or woman can be saved unless they repent. As a matter of fact, repentance precedes baptism. Repentance is needful to experience the forgiveness of our sins. When Peter proclaimed Christ at Pentecost, you remember those words that he gave to those that needed salvation. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Today, many have muddied the waters on what real salvation experience is. Different churches have different theologies, and I understand that. But I have met many Christians who said, when you've asked them if they're saved or 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 what they believe, they'll say, my church believes, or our church teaches. But the only way we're going to see real unity of believers and reach more folks with the gospel is to look at what the Bible says and what the Bible teaches. 
If repentance was needed at Pentecost for a man or a woman to be gloriously saved and receive the remission of sins and to find forgiveness, if repentance was needed at Pentecost to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, brother or sister, you and I need repentance. It's still needed today. That is the first step. That's where we begin. We hear these words in Ephesians 4. He says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here Paul presses the truth to those Christians and to us about unity and about maturity and stability. You see that we are to grow in our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, we're to grow up and we're to mature. And without that, we really can't have a stable relationship with God. Our salvation will not be stable. We'll be unstable Christians. R.C. Caudell, one of the Church of God preachers here in this area of years ago, Pastor many years at Brill Boulevard, he said, but until Christians obtain this experience, they're going to be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness. This is one of the greatest needs in every Christian's life. That is an experience that brings stability. An experience that gets us from being tossed to and fro. An experience that makes us fruitful. An experience that helps us to be faithful. An experience that we can know the fullness of Christ. If many would be honest tonight, their idea of being a saved Christian believer, you ask them, how's it going? I'll tell you, I'm just... I'm just making it. I'm barely hanging on. I'm just getting by. What's ever happened to being more than a conqueror? What's happened to being an overcomer in Christ and reigning with Christ? What's happened with being seated in heavenly places with Christ? Tonight, if you have your Bible... I invite you to turn to the 17th chapter of John. Let's all stand together. John, the 17th chapter. Now let's pray tonight the Holy Spirit will really move through this service. Man, I tell you, I could have just given you an easy one tonight. This morning's was a challenge, I'm telling you, to dig in. But I'll tell you what, we're going to dig in a little deeper tonight, okay? Let's get going. John 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, Jesus prays. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 
Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Tonight our message simply entitled A Fresh Vision of Sanctification. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you tonight. We pray, dear God, for your blessed, for your help tonight. You would bless this message, Lord, to break it and multiply it and feed your flock. Hide us behind the cross. If we, if we glory, let us glory in the cross. If we have any boasting to do, let us boast in Jesus. Lord, we honor you tonight. We count it a privilege to be called a child of God. We pray a rebuke against any spirit that would hinder this service. We pray, O oh Holy Spirit of God, that you would move in our midst and draw us all closer to you. We desperately need to hear a word from God. We ask this in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Now upon looking at what Jesus says about sanctification tonight, I realize there are some that have a teaching or belief on what their church teaches or believes. I also realize others have their own idea or opinion and I also realize others have no idea what Jesus was praying about. Some claim to have an experience, but come short on the living out of it. It reminds me of hearing about an older Christian sister when she read in Psalm 40, she read, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually Preserve me. And she said, well, that's just like the dear Lord. He takes his trusting children. He puts them in a big saucepan of his love. He sweetens them up with the sweetness of his grace so that they never get sour. And bless you, honey, when you see that one that's fretful and cross and sour and gloomy, they're not preserved. They're only pickled. Well, I want to tell you tonight, we don't need a pickled experience with God. We need a preserving experience. We need something, my friend, that will help us to get stable in our walk with God and help us to get rooted in Christ. My friend, if I don't believe God could do that for you or me, I'd close this book tonight and I would never preach it again. I believe God means what he says. Tonight we see here in Jesus' prayer, first of all, the experience of salvation takes us out of the world. We'll say that again. The experience of salvation takes us out of the world. We're, we're not physically removed of the world. That's not what Jesus means. We're in the world, but thank God we're not of the world. He said in verse 14, his prayer, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Notice, because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We'll say it again. Christians are not of the world. The word church appears at least 79, time, 79 times in the New Testament. But it never once refers to a building. Not a structure made of brick and stone and cement, but it refers to the people of God, those that have been truly saved, those that have experienced the forgiveness of God, those that have repented and they're following Christ. This is what the word church means in the New Testament. The word for church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means those called out. Christ calls us out from the world and its system of ideas. Christ calls us out from the pursuit 
of this world for just trying to make claim into this world to a higher claim. Thank God tonight Jesus gives us something this world cannot give us. Christ calls us to transform us into the Christians that he would have us to be and give us the mind that he would have us to have. And thank God, he gives us the spirit of God. And friend, I want to tell you, if you are a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. This world, thank God, it's not your home. But our home is in heaven with God. And so we are pilgrims, sojourners, as the Bible says. We're travelers through this world. Listen, hear me tonight. If you're a Christian, stop trying to live like the world and start following Christ. Next of all, we see in Jesus' prayer, the second thing here is the experience of salvation. Not only takes us out of the world, it gives us a new direction to live. Gives us a new direction. Notice verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Keep them from the evil. I agree with the way I've heard it. Well put, the things I used to love, thank God I don't anymore. The things I used to avoid, I now desire. The way I used to go, I don't go anymore. And the way I used to think, I don't think any more like that. Someone may say, well, what happened to you? And my reply is, thank God there's a new man living on the inside. The Bible says in Psalm 97, ye that love the Lord hate evil. Hear that again. If you love God, you're to hate evil. You can say, well, I have a new love. Thank God I love the Lord. Well, if you love the Lord, you also have a new fear. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. He says pride and arrogancy in the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Hey, listen, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You show me one that's humble, that hates evil, and that uses their mouth to glorify God, and I will show you one who truly understands what it is to have the fear of the Lord. That's the right definition. Thirdly, we see here in Jesus' prayer is the experience of salvation leads to the next step. Some stop just at being saved. My friend, that is not all God has for his children. He goes on and he prays here in John the 17th chapter. Now this is the Lord's prayer. The prayer that he taught in Matthew 6, teaching the disciples, that is the teaching of the disciples how to pray. That's not the Lord's prayer. God is right here revealing the very heart of his His will for us. And notice Jesus prays in John 17, 17. He prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then further down in verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they might also might be sanctified through the truth. Now friend, I'm not here tonight to split hairs over what it means to be sanctified or when one receives sanctification, or to make anyone feel less than anyone else. But I'm here to tell you tonight, there's an experience in the power of God through the work of the Holy Ghost, which roots a believer in the truth of God, and gives us a stability like nothing else will. If that's not true, Jesus' prayer was either not answered, Jesus' prayer was not true, or Jesus' prayer was only for those disciples. Yet verse 20 reaches all the way to us tonight. Thank God. Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through through their word. That means you and I, all of us, whomever is able to receive it. 
Hear me tonight. Biblical sanctification of believers by the power of the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest needs in the church today. But it's also one of the greatest and least understood. With all the opinions today, hey, if you want an opinion, just look on Facebook. You'll get plenty of opinions. But if we want the truth, we need to look to the face of God. I believe sanctification that's found in the scriptures is the hardest fought experience because the devil dislikes it and he seeks to prevent it from you and I. I'm going to tell you some things tonight that I've learned. I'm not an expert upon it. And I don't, come, I don't want to come across like a know-it-all. But I can tell you tonight, the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying a believer is one of the greatest and joyful experiences that we'll ever have this side of heaven. I remember I was preaching on living a sanctified life one time at a camp meeting in Nebraska, Indiana, several years ago. And after the service, one sister who had come to the altar for prayer, she prayed and then others had prayed and, and she happened to come up to me and she, she said, Pastor, she said that her own pastor at the church that she attended never preached on sanctification. She said her church didn't teach a sanctified experience. But she said, even with that, God gave her the experience, even though she didn't know what to call it. Amen. You see, Jesus clearly taught it. The disciples, sooner or later, they got it. The early church showed it. And I believe that God still wants every believer tonight to have it. I agree with the old fellow that said, God thought it, Jesus bought it, the Word taught it, my soul sought it, old Satan fought it, faith brought it, the Holy Ghost wrought it, and glory to God, I've got it. But I want to tell you, that's the kind of sanctification we need. Now, sanctification in the Bible carries the meaning to be set apart. If you, if you follow through the scriptures, the word sanctify means to be set apart. It also carries the meaning of purification. To be purified. And then thirdly, it carries in the Bible, the third meaning is to be dedicated as an act of consecration. And so think about those three things. When a believer is sanctified, they're set apart. When a believer is sanctified, they're purified. And when a believer is sanctified, it is as an act of consecration on your own part, you dedicate yourself, you present yourself to God as a living sacrifice, and God accepts that sacrifice, and thank God the Holy Spirit, He seals the deal. That's the way I understand it. Jesus shows us here in verse 19, he says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You see, his act of consecration made it possible that we could be recipients of the power of the Holy Spirit who cleanses our hearts by faith. Amen. Why Jesus sanctified himself so that you and I could be sanctified. I understand it like this. This is pretty simple. The blood cleanses our sins and the spirit cleanses our nature. Salvation takes us out of the world. Sanctification takes the world out of you. Do you know the neglect of sanctification can be found in reading the New Testament? Those that neglected sanctification, it caused many problems in the life of believers and the church. For instance, neglect of sanctification at the church of God in Corinth res resulted in spiritual immaturity. Paul said in 
1 Corinthians 3, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as the babes in Christ. He said, I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye, for ye yet carnal. For as there is among you envy and strife, division, are you not carnal and walk as men? You see, because of their neglect of the work of the Spirit of God, in their life, there was such carnality, immaturity, divisions. One said, I follow Paul. Another said, I follow Apollos. Listen, they all needed to get their eyes on Jesus. Because of neglect of um, sanctification, there was more than that in the church. There was immorality. There was idolatry. There was all kinds of these things. But I want to tell you what brought the church down is like what I said this morning. They were not united. And Satan worked because he was allowed to work. Listen, Satan can only work when we allow him to work. Neglect of sanctification at the church of God in Corinth brought her down. Neglect of sanctification at the church of God in Galatia resulted in bondage and legalism. Works of the flesh that why Paul had to remind him. He said in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In other words, he was saying, Look, Christ has liberated you. The Spirit of God, where the Spirit of the Lord is liberty. But you don't need to go back into bondage and live under legalism. Listen, I want to tell you, there's whole groups out there, my friend. They will take you and they will bring you under their bondage. They will judge you by what you look at like what you wear. They'll judge you. And you know that's true. Because I've been, I've been there. I've been there. One time I was preaching, at a, I will say... A, old time church of God and they didn't wear you know wedding rings jewelry you know now I, I don't believe we should be worldly I don't believe we should be worldly but brother will tell you, I wear this because I'm proud to be married to her and it's a witness. Amen? Is it not? Well, but I didn't want to be a stumbling block, so as I got up to preach, I ended up wiggling it off. And I barely ever take it off. I, I don't think I've ever had it off since that time I did this. And it's been at least 12, 15 years since this has happened. I don't even think I could get it off now. And she's probably saying, you better never take it off. <laughs> I know what it says in there. I still remember. <laughs> Y'all probably want to know, don't you? It's none of your business. <laughs> you have to get it off to see it. Well, before I got up to preach, I, I wiggled it off. Because I knew I would be judged. As soon as I went to preaching like this, there'd be some that would just absolutely cut me off. Oh, he's worldly. Look at him. He's wearing a wedding ring. Hey, you laugh, but I tell you what, there are people just like that. And so I stuck it in my pocket. And you know, as I always do, I'm kind of like a creature of habit. And I get up and I read my text and I have prayer and I pull my handkerchief out and I lay it there. But the ring got caught. And out it came. And it went flying across the platform. <laughs> Why well, didn't know it happened? And other people saw it, and the pastor, they saw it. And, and afterwards, they, he walked up to me, and he said, did you lose something? You know, and, and for a moment, I felt kind of foolish. But then I started to say, look, I don't have anything to be ashamed of. And the next night, 
I preached with it on. I said, if you want to judge me because of that and think that I don't love God, go ahead and judge me. And maybe you need another preacher. I want to tell you, my friend, you need to look and see what God's put in here. Not on the outside. The neglect of sanctification in Galatia brought great legalism into the church. The neglect of sanctification of the church of God in Ephesus resulted in this warning. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. The neglect of sanctification at the church of Laodicea resulted in this. Because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Hear me tonight. I'm almost finished, please. Nothing will establish the Christian. Nothing will get us anchored in the truth. Nothing will give us stability. Nothing will keep us going when others fall away. Nothing will keep the fire. Nothing will keep us from backsliding. Nothing will promote unity. Nothing will give us the mind of God. Nothing will help us to love one another. Nothing will make Christ so attractive like the sanctification of the Spirit in the hearts and lives of God's people. You say, well, I'm not sure God is calling me to that. Let me remind you, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. But unto holiness. We need to take heed to the call of God tonight. This I believe that if we truly would live what we say we have, my friend, we could lead others to Christ. They would want what we have. You say, I'm not sure this is God's will. Well, let me remind you, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Nothing will keep us clean and holy like the sanctified experience. Listen, nothing will help you to stay clean and out of an immoral lifestyle and have integrity with God and purity of mind and a clean heart and a desire to please God. How? Because the Spirit of God has got a hold of your life. My friend, I want to tell you, if I had two messages to preach before God called me home, I would preach full salvation and a sanctified experience that can keep you like nothing else can. You say, well, preacher, I don't know if I can keep it. I don't know if I can live it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, in the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, there's a message that's lacking today. It's the holiness message. It is. We've got so much sin in the church, my friend. We, get just, we invite people to come in and be a part of the group. And there's no deliverance or salvation from an ungodly lifestyle. We need the power of God. We need to live as God would have us to live. And we can only do it as we surrender our lives. Is that your desire tonight? Do you know tonight that you're possessing this preserving effect in your life? This personal, purifying preserving work of the Holy Spirit. I know some of you are looking at me like tonight, he's preaching something foreign to us. I can tell you tonight, my friend, is the greatest need that a Christian has. Our part is to consecrate. That's not, that's not too much. Our part is to say, Lord, here I am. 
I give you me. I give you me. I'd heard of the story about a little boy that was poor and he was invited to church and the offering plate went around and he, he didn't have anything to put in. And he felt really bad that he couldn't put anything in. He didn't have anything. The next night, he would said, you know, I'm not going to be embarrassed like that again. When the offering plate comes around, I'm going to put something in. And so the service went on the next night and the offering plate was went, going around. And he, took, he put the offering plate on the floor. And then he stepped inside the offering plate. And, his, and those sitting around heard him say these words, Lord, I just give you me. That's all God wants. That's what he wants. There's no greater gift than the gift that God's given us through Christ. He is the gift of God. The gift of salvation supersedes anything this world could ever give. Man, if you win the vax a million, it ain't going to last. You know, they say most lottery winners, they go broke really quickly. Why? Because they got all kinds of friends they never knew. You have everybody and their brother and uncle. And cousin, and cousin, cousins. You don't have cousins calling from Kentucky you didn't know you had. It won't last. But what does last is what God gives us. Why do you hold back from God? Julie and I have done our best to raise our children. I, I believe that. I haven't been perfect. She is, but I'm not. <laughs> but one thing that our children know is their mom and dad love the Lord. Amen. We've been through a lot of battles together. I'm thankful for my children. Amen. But I'm going to challenge each of you here tonight. Give God your all. You'll never regret it. Amen. And I'm going to challenge each and every one of you tonight to come and give God as the old timers say, lock, stock, and barrel. Give him it all. As we prepare a song of invitation, our part, give God your heart. God's part, he will give you his holy nature. And his holiness will be in you. You won't get it from anywhere else. Give God the kindling, and God will give you the holy fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence tonight. We pray, Holy Spirit of God, that, Lord, you would take a hold of every heart, young and old, and that, Lord, we will truly represent Christ to this lost world, those that are around, that are dying in sin. I pray tonight, Father, that you would give a fresh burden to the hearts of your people. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to gather as a church to reach many that are lost. Help us, Lord, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And help us, Father God, to lead others to this victory, this relationship, that thank God tonight, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has set us free. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. We invite you to come to the altar tonight as we stand. Come on. Your desire tonight is more of him than anything else. Come on. Your desire tonight is more of him than anything else. Step out and say, Lord, this is my prayer tonight. I want more of you. I give you me tonight. Would you do that, dear sister? Come on. I give you me tonight, Jesus. Come on, brother. Come to the Lord tonight. Come on. Come quickly. Come now. Don't hold back. Come on. Surrender to him. 
Thank you, Father. Let's sing. Since Jesus gave his life for me, should I not give him mine? I'm consecrated, Lord, to thee. I shall. Just be prayerfully seated.
Amen. Well, he's definitely given enough to chew on for a week. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's all stand. We'll ask you all to head on out. Yes. This um, evangelist was preaching about the days of Noah, and uh, then they just wanted to sing that song this morning. It was kind of uh, ironic that they sang that, but he was pointing out um, the days of Noah and how we are in those days now. And um, my heart is burdened this evening for lost souls and I want to have that burden yeah. we're living in times where people don't have a concern for right. Right. their souls right. and he pointed out how people were living in the days of Noah and they didn't have a concern and yeah. Noah went all those years and didn't win anyone preaching for the loss and couldn't win anyone because they just felt like they didn't have a care in the world. And only he and his family were saved. Yeah. And we need to have a concern that no one had for the lost, yes. but the lost need to be burdened for their own souls and stop thinking that they don't have anything to worry about. And right. in, in this day and age that we're living, that's what <clears throat> um, society has them all fooled yeah. that they're okay. Right. And we need to uh, be really burdened yes. for our lost souls. Yes. I don't know if you all want to sing that real yeah. quick. Or yeah, you do. I don't know it, but I'll, I'll just post it real quick. But. Way back in the Bible days, no one told the people said it's going to rain. They didn't listen, no, they paid him no mind. And when the rain came, they were left behind. I'll tell you, it's going to rain. Get ready, it's going to rain. You better get ready and bear this in mind. Cause God showed Noah, showed him the rainbow sign. He said it won't be water, but fire the next time. Oh, they tell me when the waters began to fall, they knocked on the window, they knocked on the door. They didn't know exactly what to do. Now you don't want this to happen to you. I tell you, it's going to rain. Get ready. It's going to rain. You better get ready and bear this in mind. Cause God showed Noah, showed him the rainbow sign. He said it won't be water, but fire the next time. Oh, they tell me when they put Jesus in the grave, he rose again on the third day. He said, I am the Son of God, and I'm coming back to take you where no man's trod. I tell you, it's going to rain. Get ready. It's going to rain. You better get ready. And bear this in mind, cause God showed Noah, showed him the rainbow sign. He said it won't be water, but fire the next time. Amen. That's the truth, too. Yeah. Well, all hearts and minds clear. Come back Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We'll be looking for you. Yes. All right? Amen. Colin, would you dismiss us?